Thank you, Dr. Ganil. Such a huge issue. So our final briefing session today is on university industry collaboration in teaching and learning review outcomes. And uh, no promises, we might have some time for some questions from our distinguished speakers in this particular session. So please pop it in, ask a question, and uh, also in the chat. And please welcome Professor Martin Bean, CBA, former Vice Chancellor of RMIT University, and Professor Peter Dawkins, AO, former Vice Chancellor of Victoria University. Over to you. Well, thanks very much, Claire. Martin and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which we're meeting today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also say how delighted we are to be talking at this very important conference about our review of uh, industry university collaboration in teaching and learning that we have been doing this year, commissioned by Minister Tudge. I'm going to share some slides on the screen and um, hopefully they're now showing up. And there the cover slide says, review of university industry collaboration in teaching and learning. And uh, uh, the um, first slide there tells you a bit about our terms of reference. So as the first paragraph says there, the review considered how universities, industry and government can increase industry engagement in teaching and learning through improved course curricula, more systemic engagement and expanded opportunities for students to gain work experience and industry relevant skills. You can also see that the focus of the review had two distinct segments in mind. Firstly, young people establishing a foothold in the skilled labour market and secondly, skilled individuals with career experience looking to upskill or reskill. And the scope of our work was to improve work integrated learning, uh, expand uh, opportunities uh, for combining work study and ongoing skill development and, uh, and also um, you can see uh, looking at um, assessment and uh, curriculum and assessment and enhancing pathways and partnerships between schools, vet, higher education uh, and industry. So before we um, talk about what has been coming out of the review, uh, we did give quite a bit of attention to what is the problem we're trying to solve here? What are the challenges that we uh, that, we're, that, that this review is seeking to address. And we had a good discussion with the Minister about this. And we were trying to deal with five challenges. Firstly, higher education industry partnerships could be stronger. So there's, there's uh, a lot of good university industry partnerships around Australia in, in research and in our focus of teaching and learning as well. But when we benchmark internationally, we could see that there was plenty of scope for improvement and we presented some evidence on our benchmarking against uh, international best practice. So there is scope for improvement and to, to help innovation, human capital development and productivity by stronger higher education industry partnerships. Secondly, young people are finding it harder to transition from education to skilled employment. Ever since the global financial crisis, it has been proving harder for young people to get into skilled employment pathways. A lot of evidence about this. Employers increasingly looking for experience as well as qualifications and, and skills. And uh, so working between universities and industry to provide that experience to help students transition uh, became another important focus. Higher education must meet the needs of lifelong learners. So universities do play a part in this, but really need to play a bigger part. There's huge capability in the higher education sector and it's underutilized in helping lifelong learners uh, to, uh, to develop the additional skills they need as they develop through their careers. Fourthly, Australia is facing crucial skill shortages as it emerges from COVID-19. And that's a particularly strong focus, of course, of industry and employers as we were doing our review. How could university industry collaboration help deal with the problem of skill shortages? And finally, there should be more collaboration and alignment between the higher education and vocational education sectors to help meet these, these challenges. Higher education working closer together with vocational education as well as industry is, is necessary. So those are the challenges that we 
we're trying to address. And uh, the next two slides will give you an idea of the kind of ideas that have been coming out of our review. Uh, we expect a report to, to come out in, uh, in the coming weeks, but here's a couple of slides that give you a bit of an idea of the sorts of things that, that you can expect to see. Martin will, uh, will now take over on, the, on, on this next slide. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everybody. Peter, what a pleasure it's been to work with you on this project and how much fun it's been to do the very broad consultations that uh, we've done since this was kicked off. I'll, I'll give you a little lesson. When you're retiring as a vice chancellor, be very wary when a minister whispers in your ear, would you like to do a little bit of work for me, please? Because it turns out to be a lot more than you had anticipate, but it's been a, a wonderful journey. And Claire, it's lovely to see you and thank you for chairing this and Peter Coldrake and fellow commissioners, Steve and others, thank you for allowing Peter and I to participate. As Peter said, our, our recommendations are taking good shape. You're getting a little bit of a sneak peek of them today. They're not finalized yet, and we haven't formally sent them across to, uh, to the minister. But given this amazing conference and the breadth of attendees, we thought it was good that, that we showed you where we were up to. And so, first of all, there's a, high, a, a series of high-level architectural um, actions that we're recommending, three of them, in fact. Uh, and these are improvements to the architecture of Australia's education system that we believe will support collaboration in teaching and learning between higher education and industry. The first of those is to really accelerate the development and use of the Australian skills classification as an open access national skills taxonomy. One of the things that it's very clear from um, emerging initiatives around the world, some of which you heard about um, earlier in this session, is the need to really develop a currency of skills built around rich skill descriptors, not just simple labels of skills, but really well-defined, well-written and agreed rich skill descriptors by all of the stakeholders that we can use to really do a better job of signaling what it is we're teaching, what are the roles that are available um, in the world of work, what are the ones that are emerging, just to better align the system. The second one is really quite easy. Um, everybody agrees the Noonan Review was a wonderful piece of work. It was universally accepted. While well, Peter and I are really saying with the second one is, let's get on with it now. Let's implement the proposed reforms as outlined in the Noonan Review, because they're absolutely critical to enable much of what we're recommending through our piece of work. The third is one I've spent a lot of time on, and it sort of is linked to the graphic, the, the mock-up, um, the, the, the wireframe, if you will, that's on the screen in front of you. There's a number of different initiatives being funded and developed in the sector right now. Uh, the National's Credential Platform, the National Micro Credentials Marketplace. Um, there's the Your Career site from the National Careers Institute, the Skills Commission doing the work on, on skills, et cetera, et cetera. And so our recommendation here is to pull those initiatives together in a unified architecture. That doesn't mean a single platform. What it means is a platform that has an eye to interoperability and integration. So this recommendation is about building a unified credentials platform to surface current and emerging skill shortages, provide guidance to individuals to make informed learning decisions, link to quality micro credentials. And there's if when you read our report, you'll see we echo much of what we just heard from the QAA in the United Kingdom and act as a bridge to labor market opportunities. Uh, next slide, please, Peter. I think we're back to you, sir. So, um, so here we have actual uh, interventions in the in in education uh, and training and the and the marketplace to to enhance university industry collaboration, building on the the enhancements in architecture that Martin's been talking about. The first one is to. Uh, is to build a stronger culture of partnerships in the delivery of industry-focused micro-credentials. And, uh, and we've heard about micro-credentials in the UK earlier this afternoon. Martin's actually an expert on micro-credentials. I might get Martin just to sure. elaborate a little I bit know, on I, that, that I number one, the and then I'll talk about the others. Yeah, I handed the baton too quickly, Peter. Sorry about that. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, another one of mine. And, you know, what's really important, as we heard from the earlier um, presentation is that we have to ensure these credentials provide good public value. Uh, and what we're recommending here or, or in draft form is that there is some targeted investment 
to create incentives for higher education providers and industry to collaborate to actually produce meaningful micro-credentials at a unit of consumption with appropriate skill descriptors to achieve the outcomes that we want for the learners that are going through them. Uh, and, and that then gives us a, um, a, a series of offerings that can be put inside the national credentials, uh, micro-credentials marketplace, but also we'll do a better job of what Peter and I have heard loud and clear from industry and higher education providers, which is a lot more flexibility in the ability to develop these in collaboration with industry than we were able to do last year as we quickly responded to uh, the, the short course funding that, that was put into the system to respond to COVID. Back to you, Peter. Yes, thank you, Martin. So uh, number two is about what you might call learning integrated work. We distinguish in our review between learning integrated work and work integrated learning. We'll come to work integrated learning in number three, but number two, learning integrated work. This is where you combine an employment contract with a learning program, whether it be called a cadetship, an advanced apprenticeship, there are various names. We recommend the rolling out of a flexible higher education cadetship program, combining an employment contract and a learning program. And there are two types of uh, cadetships that we, we're floating for, for, the, for the minister to think about. First is short cadetships, which would be aimed at individuals nearing the end of their studies. So uh, they might complete a degree, but then you might add on uh, a short cadetship that might involve a micro-credential of the kind that Martin's been talking about uh, with some work experience that help that transition from education into employment. And the second type is a longer term cadetship aimed at individuals who might seek to undertake work-based learning for the duration of their qualification. So they might get an employment contract and alongside that do an associate degree or a degree uh, that is intimately connected with their with their work experience. So there have been some, um, some experiments in advanced apprenticeships in Australia, it's building on that experience. And of course, in, in Britain, they've had, uh, they've had this degree apprenticeships. So these are the kind of ideas that we think their time has come in Australia because of the importance of experience for many people if they're going to be successful uh, in using qualifications to, to, to actually uh, get skilled employment and uh, no, no better thing than to get that experience through through a cadetship for many people in many areas. So that's the second of our four ideas in this space. The third one uh, is quite a broad one, enhance higher education's engagement with industry through the MPILF, the National Partnerships Industry Linkage Fund, and the National Strategy on, uh, on Work Integrated Learning. So quite a lot of this is about work integrated learning, in, in which a lot of work's going in through the MPILF. And uh, we, add some recommendations about how to enhance work integrated learning, build off the MPILF uh, and um, improve the marketplace for work integrated learning, perhaps look at having a digital marketplace, really work hard on making that national strategy on work integrated learning that, uh, that industry has been working with higher education on, make that really work. So uh, building off the, off the national partnerships uh, fund. But then a broader set of ideas about how to make sure that uh, that industry does play an increased role in helping to shape shape the, the outcomes of education, uh, of higher education. And um, one of the issues here that's particularly relevant, I think, in the context of a Texas conference is that some people have been telling us that the higher education standards may provide a bit of an impediment to making good use of industry partnerships in education uh, in higher education. And so we think it would be worth having a look at the higher education standards just to see whether there are any, any, any impediments to really making that university uh, higher education collaboration work to enhance teaching and learning. So there'll, there'll, there'll be quite a lot of stuff in that space when you, when you do see the report. The fourth one goes to cross-sectoral partnerships. So it's clear from our discussions with industry and with the different sectors but there's a lot to be gained for students and for industry if we can get greater collaboration going between higher education, vocational education and schools and, and, and industry. And we think that there should be stimulation and incentives for 
higher education, vet schools to work together in collaboration with industry with innovations in course design, co-delivery, credit practices, models in work-based learning, place-based uh, examples of working together, perhaps in particular industry sectors. So that gives you an idea of the sorts of things that we think could be moved on fairly quickly uh, alongside the enhancements in the, uh, in, the, in the higher education sort of architecture we were talking about earlier. We were also asked to talk about longer term reform directions and the sorts of things that we, that we think the minister should think about is in the longer term, moving towards a more integrated tertiary sector with seamless pathways from school and that could involve changes in regulation, changes in funding arrangements and so on. Talking of funding arrangements, reviewing the incentives that are in place for students, employers and higher education providers to optimise investment in human capital development and uh, to optimise the amount of higher education uh, industry uh, collaboration. Lifelong learning accounts could be looked at, for example, alongside possible tax incentives for industry. Thirdly, expanding the scale of activity of some of our initiatives for the short term get going monitor them, see how they go and expand them as they prove to be successful. And that's linked also to the fourth one about the possible extension and expansion of the MPILF as we learn from the experience of universities implementing their projects through, through the MPILF. So that I think completes our presentation and uh, we look forward to any questions that, uh, that you might have. Thank you. We actually, the questions are pretty low, so if you have questions, please post them or in the chat and we'll look at those. But uh, there is a ripper question, and I'm going to go to you, Professor Dawkins, for this question. We would love to hear your thoughts on whether the AQF is too rigid and impinges on the ability for vocational and higher education to collaborate across programs. What's your thoughts on that? Yes, well, as Martin said, we, we thoroughly endorse the Munin Review, which did say that the, um, the AQF is too hierarchical. It tends to see uh, the, the relationship between vocational and education in this hierarchical, hierarchical way, um, and that you, you progress from, from you know, certificates to diplomas to degrees in, 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 in a rigid hierarchical way. Whereas if you think more broadly about the packaging of skills, experience, and um, uh, and, uh, and generic capabilities that people need to, uh, to, 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 to conduct uh, occupational roles in industry, then a much more flexible combination of skills uh, and knowledge and capabilities that could, that could mix and match across higher education, vocational education in a much more flexible way would be in the best interests of education and of industry. And that we think would be made possible with a more flexible AQF of the kind that Peter Noonan's recommended. So the answer to that is a, is a very firm yes. Thank you so much, Professor Dawkins. I have a question now for Professor Bean. And the question is, should the government reduce the cost for an organisation looking to sponsor international students' PR visas? This is likely to lead to an increase in employment of international students we need to remove obstacles with cadetships, co-op, internships not being offered for international students. What's your thoughts on that? So, Claire, we're, according to the media, we're heading into an election season. So I'll practice my evasive answering to this question for the, the, the group. Um, first of all, I totally agree with the second part of this question, which is we need to remove the obstacles for our international students to participate in meaningful work experiences in, in Australia. My personal belief, Claire, is that that has as much to do with actually educating employers in Australia what the work visa rights that our international students have and how they can be used and overcoming some of the stereotypical images of the value that those international students provide to the um, Australian community and economy. And I think if you just look at how many employers are crying out for the return of international students to help bolster and, and power our economy right now and our communities, by the way, socially, then I have to totally agree with the person asking this question, which is anything that we can do to reduce the barriers, whether they're barriers of perception or barriers of funding 
that is affordable and provides a meaningful outcome for the individual and for our society is something that we should be advocating for. Thank you so much. And uh, I've got a question actually for both of you. So uh, I might go to you first, Professor Dawkins, on this one. So with lifelong learning and reskilling multiple times during people's working lives, could there be a funding loan incentive for individuals who may have attained higher education levels previously, i.e. disconnect subsidising it from AQF level already obtained to last time the individual has access to secondary education? So a big question, but uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think if I, if I understand the question correctly, um, the point being made is that, uh, that we're in a world now where people will be needing to move in and out of education, both higher education and vocational education in unpredicted, in unpredictable sort of non-linear ways. So they might complete a degree uh, then find it's a good idea to get a vocation, a micro-credential or a vocational certificate to help them get a job. Then they, then after a period of time, they, they find they've got to upskill or reskill in some area or other, whether it be a postgraduate higher education or another vocational certificate. And, and that it would be advantageous if funding arrangements were flexible and enable people to, uh, to access appropriate funding where it's in the public interest rather than just in their own interest or in the interest of the firm they're working for um, to the benefit of the Australian economy. And, and there are in some funding schemes uh, restrictions on the extent to which, for example, people can go back to vocational education having already got a degree. So yeah, look, the principle of that I think is a good one. And, uh, and, and that's why in our long-term directions, we, uh, we did say, A, that we need a more integrated tertiary sector, and B, we need to review the incentives uh, that would make for optimal investments in this new, more ideally more flexible world. And we did say lifelong learning accounts is something that might be worth looking at, which is, I think, what's being implied here. Um, and uh, so well worth exploring. Thanks, Claire. Excellent. And Claire, just really quickly for me, if it was COVID safe, I would reach out and give a hug to the person that asked this question. I've been fighting for 14 years now to get rid of this notion that everybody works in one-way traffic in tertiary education. Uh, that life is so much more complicated than that. And both in the United Kingdom and Australia, quite frankly, I think it's barking mad that the funding only goes one way when actually sometimes it's a lower level qualification according to the AQF, that will be your ticket to get to the job you need to launch your career to unlock the value of your entire tertiary education. So I'm not going to mince words at all on that one, Claire. Thank you so much. I knew you would have a view on that, Professor Bean. So um, uh, there's actually a question. I'm not sure who should answer. You tell me. Can you define what you mean um, by cross-sectional uh, teaching and learning innovation fund? Yeah, that's a Professor Dawkins one, that one. Go Claire. for it. So, um, look, there are examples where higher ed and vocational education are working well together, uh, particularly on, on uh, stacking qualifications or getting good credit pathways, perhaps working together in particular industry sectors. So at my former university, Victoria University, we had a School for the Visitor Economy, where higher education and vocational education work together with the with the, the visitor economy sector, particularly in Victoria, to promote collaboration across across sectors. Um, there are examples of these kind of collaborations, particularly in dual sector universities, not only in dual sector universities, between university, you know, universities and, and TAFEs. And I and some good examples of working with schools as well to help young people. Uh, develop these pathways in partnership with industry, but we think that few and far between to compared to the best practice. And we like there to be some support to promote that kind of collaboration between all sectors in in education and with industry. And so that's that's what we're we're on about with that uh, that idea. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to both of you for a really quick. Concluding observations, what's your big takeaway? Uh, Professor Dawkins, I'll start with you. Oh, look, the time is right now for these kind of initiatives. We've seen some announcements overnight about research commercialisation, industry, university partnerships. 
now the time's right to have a look at how to really make industry and university work together effectively to help develop the skills needed for the Australian economy as we come out of the COVID-19 recession. So we're excited about uh, the Minister having a look at our report and, and in, in, over the next few weeks and coming out with his reactions, And uh, but we, we just think it's a very timely, very timely thing. Martin, what would you like to yeah. add? Really quickly, because we're out of time, Claire, it's not going to be easy, but Australia needs us to have an integrated and interoperable system that puts the component pieces together with our citizens at the centre to get them the skills that they need in every stage of their life to live out their potential for themselves, their family and their communities. And thank you, everybody, for feeding into our review. Thank you so much, Professor Dawkins and Professor Bain. Absolutely loved this session and all of them, actually. It's been an amazing day. And I'd like to thank all of our briefing panellists from this afternoon. Thank you so much. And that brings us to our final sessions for today. It is my pleasure to introduce Texa Commissioners, Professor Joan Cooper, Ms Adrian Newenhouse and Mr Stephen Samogi. And they have the big task of concluding and providing their observations on today's conference. Over to you.